Hello, I'm Sarah Howard, Curator of Social Practice at the University of South Florida Contemporary Art Museum. We appreciate you joining us for this conversation featuring artist Marianne Nicholson, Koyo Zintili, and artist and curator Wendy Red Star as part of USF CAM's education programs for the exhibition Native America in Translation. Following a few brief remarks and acknowledgements, I will introduce the artists for this conversation as we review images and allow time for questions before the end of this hour long program. Please share any questions you may have over the course of the conversation in the Q&A window located at the bottom of the Zoom window. I also wanna point out that closed captioning is available in the Zoom platform. I would like to start by sharing a land acknowledgement. The University of South Florida resides on the traditional homelands and territories of the Seminole, as well as historical groups, including the Calusa and Tocobago. The state of Florida is now home to the Seminole, Miccosukee, Muscogee, Choctaw, and individuals from many other native groups. The USF Contemporary Art Museum res respectfully acknowledges and values these communities and will approach our programs, our collection, and our relationships in ways that honor the perspectives and contributions of indigenous peoples. If you're interested in learning more about the historic and contemporary indigenous nations around the globe, please use the link in the chat to visit the Native Land Digital Platform, an indigenous-led nonprofit based in Canada. USF CAM is honored to be the fourth institution to present this show following presentations at the Princeton University Art Museum and the Milwaukee Art Museum, among others. We would like to acknowledge Aperture for their generous organization and the exhibition, exhibiting artists for, the, for lending their work, as well as extend gratitude to the Smithsonian National Museum of the American Indian Archive Center and the Princeton University Art Museum for loaning work from their collections. Following the presentation here in Tampa, Native America in Translation will travel to the Museum of Contemporary Photography in Chicago in early 2024, and then onto the Blanton Museum of Art in Austin, Texas for the latter part of next year. So if you're in those areas, please be sure and check this show out. Native America in Translation is made possible in part with generous support from the National Endowment for the Arts. The USF CAM presentation is supported in part by the USF College of the Arts, the Lee and Victor Levengood Endowment, the USF CAM Art for Community Engagement Fund patrons, and the Florida Department of State Florida Arts and Culture. Funding for this and related programs was provided through a grant from Florida Humanities with funds from the National Endowment for the Humanities. I also want to extend deep gratitude to the incredibly talented team at CAM for their valuable efforts that contributed to all aspects of organizing, mounting, and promoting this exhibition and its related programs. Native America in Translation is curated by Absalaka artist Wendy Red Star and expands on her role as guest editor of the fall 2020 issue of Aperture Magazine. Please be sure to check out this publication, which is available via the Aperture website. The magazine includes an in-depth conversation with Wendy Red Star and Emily Mozami, assistant head archivist at the National Museum of the American Indian, as well as informative essays about the work of artists included in the show. Native America in Translation assembles the wide ranging work of nine indigenous artists who pose challenging questions about identity and heritage land rights, and histories of colonialism. Probing the leg legacies of settler colonialism and photography's complex and often fraught role in constructing representation of native cultures. The exhibition includes works by lens-based artists offering new perspectives on indigenous identity, reimagining what it means to be a citizen in North America today. Now for introductions for, of our featured guests, and to learn more about these artists and their works, please follow the links to the artist's websites in the chat. Wendy Red Star is a Portland, Oregon-based artist raised on the Absalaka Reservation. Her work is informed by both her Native American cultural heritage and her engagement with many forms of creative expression, including photography, sculpture, 
video, fiber arts, and performance. An avid researcher of archives and historical narratives, Red Star seeks to recast her research offering new and unexpected perspectives that are inquisitive, witty, and unsettling. Red Star's first major monograph, Delegation, here, you can't see it here, uh, was co-published by Aperture and Documentary Arts in May, 2022. And last month, Wendy unveiled a new work as part of Beyond Granite, pulling together the first curated outdoor exhibition installed on the National Mall in Washington, DC. And I understand her sculpture titled The Soil You See, commissioned for the exhibition curated by Monument Lab, has found a permanent home on Crow Land at the Tippett Rise Art Center on lands we now refer to as Fishtail, Montana. It's nice to have you join us, Wendy. Marianne Nicholson is an artist and activist of the Muskamuk des de Nu First Nations, part of the Kwakwakewak. Wakwala speaking peoples of the Pacific Northwest Coast. She's trained in both traditional Kwakwakewak forms of culture and contemporary gallery and museum based practice. She holds a Bachelor of the Arts, of, of Fine Arts from the Emily Carr University of Art and Design, a Master of Fine Arts from the University of Victoria, as well as a Master of Arts and PhD in Linguistics and Anthropology with a focus on space as expressed in the Kwakwala language. Nicholson works as a Kwakwakewak cultural researcher and historian, as well as an advocate for indigenous land rights. Her practice is multidisciplinary, encompassing photography, painting, carving, video, installation, monument and public art, writing and speaking. Welcome, thank you for being here, Marianne. Thank you. Koya Zin <laughs> Thanks. Koya Zintil is an interdisciplinary artist and healer and educator living in New York. She grew up on the coast of Ecuador and the Andes, and it's these geographies that permeate her work. She focuses on geopoetics, ancestral technologies, ritual and storytelling through collaborative processes and personal narratives. Intersectional theories and earth-based healing informs her practice, which encompasses sonic instrumentation and performance. Nominated for the Prix Pictic in 2019, her work has been exhibited in the National Portrait Gallery in Washington, DC, the United Nations, Aperture Foundation in New York, and Paris Photo, among others. In 2022, she was an artist in residence at the Socrates Sculpture Park and was also awarded the Latinx Artist Fellowship by US Latinx Art Forum. Thank you for being here, Koyo. Thank you. So we, we have uh, prepared a slideshow that we'd like to um, share and talk about some of each of your individual practice before we talk a little bit deeper about the actual exhibition. And Wendy, in your role as guest editor of the fall 2020 Aperture Magazine, Native America, and subsequently as the curator of the exhibition, Native America in Translation, this stemmed from your research during your 2018 Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship. And we have a few images to share of your recent work. Can you tell us more about these works and what inspired them? Yeah, um, well, first off, it's wonderful to be here to be talking about Native America in translation um, with two amazing artists from the show. And I also wanna thank uh, USF for uh, having us there. Um, as you said, um, I did a, a Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship in 2018, and I was specifically interested in the National Museum of the American Indians holdings of crow objects, um, and also looking at their photographs. Um, and when I was looking at the objects, the uh, crow possessions there, um, I gathered some of my family names, and there are pretty good records um, 
about who, who owns the objects, which in, is, can be pretty rare. Um, and so I was able to find over a hundred objects in the collection that are biologically related to me, which was pretty amazing. Um, and then when I went to look at the photos, um, I have a great, great grandma, uh, her uh, crow name translated into English is her dreams are true or dreams the truth. And so I was looking through these photos, uh, historical photos, and I came across this portrait that you're seeing here. Um, and I looked at the notes and it said, Julia bad boy, uh, her dreams are true. <laughs> and immediately I knew this is my great, great grandma. I've ne never had seen a picture of her, um, nor had my dad. Um, and it's such a, a beautiful photo of her. So this, this image, um, has been a huge inspiration. I've made a few different artworks. So th this piece is called Omnia and Omnia is a Crow word for echo. And so when I was looking at all these um, like ancestors that are biologically related to me, I was thinking about DNA and how, how um, dreams the truth DNA sort of echoes through me and through my child. So um, I did, a portrait of Beatrice, my daughter, and then she took a portrait of me and I created um, an outfit similar. It's a, a crow style dress as what um, Dreams the Truth is wearing. And our hair is done in like the crow fashion. And so these are sort of echoing portrait busts. We can go on to the next one. And then this is a series um, called the 1880 Crow Peace Delegation in uh, 2014. Um, and these works, I focused on this uh, delegation of six Crow chiefs who traveled to DC in 1880 and were photographed by Charles Milton Bell. He was the um, chief photographer of the Bureau of Ethnology. Um, and there was so much uh, richness to this particular trip, um, this 1880 trip, where um, they they traveled there because the U.S. government was trying to put a train through a, a large track of our hunting territory. But beyond that, um, there's a lot of uh, written material about what they did when they were in D.C. and how they got there. Um, and so I started researching each photograph, delegation portrait. And in that, um, I started really looking into what they were wearing, what they were trying to say through their clothing. And, and basically they're saying how they became a chief. And so different parts of the outfit represents things that they had to do in order to become a chief. And this is Medicine Crow, um, can go to the next one. And this is a, a full portrait. And some of the things I can point out quickly is um, he's wearing hair extensions. You can see uh, it, the hair extension kind of pulled to the ground. Um, he's wearing his hair in like a typical uh, crow fashion. They had these pompadours and they would um, make them stiff like that with white clay. So that's why it uh, appears white. Um, and then the long strips on his, um, shirt and on his leggings um, represent that he uh, captured a gun and he also captured a horse. Um, so this was a really amazing project and um, also ties to the research that I was doing in DC as well. That's amazing. I, I think those um, busts, just that manifestation of the material manifestation, the, the kind of uh, form that they've taken is just really beautiful and powerful. Of um, thank you. Finding those photographs must have been so special. All right, um, Marianne, we were so excited that we were able to accommodate your illuminated installation mm -hmm. as part of our show, um, and it's titled "Where Are We Going and What Is to Become of Us in Our Gallery Spaces uh, at Cam." 
And I wonder if you could expand on your approach to engaging these uh, photographic archives and the pictogram symbols that you use um, through this like ephemeral form of light um, and how they sort of perform like memories. Um, and for our, for our audience that may have not visited this space, um, there's a etched glass panel that is um, illuminated from above that is casting this shadow on the, on the gallery floor, creating this image. Yeah, I, in listening to Wendy talk about her pieces, there's quite a bit that really resonates through this work that is um, similarly grounded in ideas around memory um, and, the, and the use of the photograph. And uh, it was this kind of interesting relationship between our people and colonial photographers who were coming through and documenting. Um, and they had a very different kind of um, agenda um, but one of the things that I was interested in is um, what we were saying through that medium in being photographed, in being the subjects. Um, one of the things that uh, in the photograph that's shown within this piece, and this, this piece really um, does refer back to um, the medium of photography as, um, you know, a medium of light. And... Um, it wasn't foreign to us though to use medium as a light as as Kwakiwak people. I, I heard this story of um, you know my grandfather and also my grandfather's um, uncle who would perform a dance as part of a ceremony and they would uh, follow a beam of light that had come through the roof of the ceremonial house and hold their hand up to that light and then follow it. And of course, this would take a very, very long time. Like I was thinking of the commitment of that, um, but then also thinking of um, you know light as a as a medium then uh, and 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 in photography. So you have this light cast, and through the technology of photography, you're able to capture this mom moment in time. And so there's this photograph of um, these children. Uh, that was taken around 1936, 1938. And um, I have a living memory of um, two of them, the two smallest ones in the middle. Uh, one of them was my uncle Tom, who was married to my mo mother's older sister, Amy. Um, and the other one, we called her O.O.D., uh, Gertrude Dick. And, and she has a headpiece on her head in the form of a bird. So. I was thinking about this living memory that I have of these old people. <laughs> we call them Koskoliak. And how I only knew them as elders. And yet in this photograph, here they are, children. And so in the same way that uh, Wendy's looking at this intergenerational representation and concept of the self that's layered, you know, I was thinking in the same way. Um, but using the photograph as a way to kind of um, reflect on that. And the other interesting aspect that I also found resonated with Wendy's work is that, in fact, at the time that the, this photograph was taken, um, our potlatch was banned by the Canadian government. It was outlawed. So the only way that they were able to wear their regalia that you see them wearing, their button blankets and their headpieces, um, was because they are our, our old people... Uh, proposed that we would do a celebration um, for King George V. And because of that, we they were able to pull out their um, sacred regalia and put it on and be photographed in, in it. Um, so this was them actually appropriating kind of European forms of celebration in order to perpetuate their own traditions, which by that, by the colonial government were being suppressed. But those, the important part of these images and, and the fact that they're photographed is that these, this regalia exists as a text in itself. Uh, if you understand how to read the regalia, then you would be able to understand that what they are wearing, what is being transmitted through these children is land title. Because each of these things would relate to a specific story on the land that... Um, uh, expressed 
it was our way of expressing land title. So these are actually legal documents. And I created the work in such a way that the light casts through the photograph and through the glass onto the floor. And that's the interrelationship of our bodies to the land itself. So the pictographic style is um, reminiscent of um, petroglyphs, carving in rock. Um, and then it's in the work cast onto the floor so that the people who view the work or participate in it, um, you know, walk across that space in a way that is relating back to land. And uh, in that way, um, I think that there, there are threads that um, also reach out to other, other works in this exhibition. That's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing that sort of in-depth uh, understanding of the work. And where do you source these images, these photographs from? Uh, this, these ones were interesting. There was a school teacher who was um, stationed in Kinkham, uh, at my home community, uh, at the time that this celebration was happening, and she photographed it. And then her photographs were put into the Anglican archive, and we were able to access them maybe, I don't know how many years ago we gained access to that, um, but it was it was really valuable for us to find. Yeah, I, I would think so. It's, it's interesting, the more I learn about this is like how these archives are put together and sort of formulated, but we can, we can dig into that a little bit later. Uh, Koyo, thank you for sharing images from your series Meta that are included in the exhibition, as well as additional images from this series that were, I believe, shot in the landscape of New Mexico. Can yes. you tell us more about this series and the origin story that inspired it? Absolutely. Uh, well, thank you for having me. And it was really a pleasure to be able to listen to Wendy and, and Marianne talk and, and just see how I understand the connections of the works is so much more. Um, so um, if you move to the following image, uh, when, as someone who comes from Avia Yala, what we know as South America, I carry my origin stories with me. And one of the stories is of, uh, one of my origin stories is of a woman that comes from the ocean. And this is the first person, Umiña, which is actually the name of that I gave my daughter. And she creates uh, humans by uh, playing the, the conch. So this is like the first woman and she's in a cave and she plays the conch and everything is wet and moist. And then humans start um, connecting into the, into the caves and, and then, the, then we have our people. And as I was traveling and I moved to New Mexico, I started thinking about um, how our our, our first connection to the land is in our bodies and our bodies are our first con and in the land is our first connection to our to our body so the body and the land and the land and the body and they they mirror each other and as i was walking in the, in in new mexico in this landscape i thought of um the the way that i experienced it was i felt that i was in in the deep ocean and all of a sudden there's no water and there is this landscape so that's how i felt when i was here in in this image <laughs> that you're seeing at the moment and that reminded me of this uh, origin story that i'm mentioning and i started um thinking about well what are the origin stories of the people that i'm meeting here and uh, the uh, indigenous and also the, the Latinas, the Latinx, um, that um, the Afro, uh, Afro indigenous, Afro uh, New Mexican, Afro Hispanic. And, um, and I start asking, uh, connecting with the local people and asking um, the sitters, these women, um, if they can, 
trace back, if they could trace back their most ancient ancestor, what do they think their that ancestor would do if they were touching the earth for the first time? So as they went into this journey, um, we together, we chose the location and we chose, they really chose how they wanted to be portrayed. And uh, and that's how this series um, evolved and was created. Wow. That must have been a really special experience to be out in the landscape creating these images. Absolutely. Very- I mean- yeah, yeah, I mean the um the origin stories was what connected the whole body of of work. Just to think about, I kept thinking about this idea of like this two million year old women, and what does that two million year old woman would do? Would be how would she? What what? Yeah, what they would do if they were on the earth right now. So it was it was quite an amazing um, experience and journey to be able to collaborate and create all these images with all of them. Wow, yeah, they're beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing that. Mm-hmm. Wonderful. So, um, I mean, let's look at some of the other uh, images of the installation from the exhibition. And Wendy, you've spoken about how you've conceived of both the magazine and the exhibition as sort of a roadmap for native, young Native artists um, as it assembles this intergenerational group of Indigenous artists with distinct practices. And would you walk us through some of your selections for Native America? Uh, Yes. Um, So uh, I just want to talk a little bit about Aperture. And um, they approached me in 2020 and the issue came out fall of 2020. And it was the first issue to come out during the pandemic. So it was pandemic times um, and being able to work on the magazine was so great for me to feel connected in that very weird time that we all went through. Um, So I'm really grateful to all the artists um, for inspiring me during that time and uh, their important work. Uh, So right now we're seeing uh, Martin Guterres. Um, Martin uh, has a piece called Indigenous Woman, and um, it's a magazine um, where Martine plays editor, journalist, model, all everything that uh, has to do with the magazine. And these are some of the, the images um, from the magazine, Indigenous Woman. And we, um, because we had the magazine, uh, Native American magazine as part of uh, our publication for the show, we decided to publish a poster of Martine's work that's sort of like a fold out kind of um, pin up poster of one of her images. I don't know if you can see it, but um, as a giveaway for our uh, visitors to the museum. In, in Mar- Martine's work, it, it connects a lot with um, all the artists. I feel like all the artists are are telling uh, a story um, and I'm really attracted to that and uh, photography. So all of these artists are approaching um, photography through storytelling or preservation, um, all of those things I found really interesting. Martine also has a lot of performance art, video art, so I always find that fascinating to see how that translates to um, a photo. Yeah, and there's a wide range of characters represented in her work. And this is Ellen Michelson. Um, 
He's a great artist. He lives in New York City. And this piece is the town destroyer. Um, it's about the history of um, uh, Washington and the Haudenosaunee. And it is a, a those are uh, photographs of stills. And then there is a, a video that plays and it's projected onto um, this wool trade blanket. Yeah, this is a really powerful work uh, to, to experience in person. Uh, and this is uh, Dwayne Linklater. He's Cree. Um, and I, you know, connected with all the artists. And when I connected with Dwayne, I asked if he'd want to participate in, in the uh, magazine issue. And right away, he mentioned um, the first issue that Aperture did uh, focused on Native people and wanted to do an intervention with that piece. So these um, photos depict um, fol folded um, pages from, folded pages with his drawings from um, the first magazine. And I thought that was so great. Dwayne has this ability, uh, well, I, I always find it really cool where anytime he works with an institution, he always asks them, what their history is of working with indigenous people. Um, and so this, this piece reflects um, that aspect of him. Yeah, and, and I, I understood he had it uh, recomposed uh, different compositions for every iteration that it's been shown and sort of kind of responding to that sort of working with the grid and the kind of line work and folding and re sort of assembling, I guess, this work in multiple ways. I love, I love that uh, he does that for each venue. Yeah. And this, uh, Kim Owan Mitchell, he's also a Cree artist. Um, he is no longer with us, but I um, first encountered um, Kim Owan's work on Facebook, um, there was a another uh, native artist who had posted something about Kim Owan and it, it was like a memorial post. So I got curious and I, I clicked on that post and it sent me to uh, Kim Owan's Facebook, personal Facebook. Um, and then I just started sort of looking through the images. Um, this is like wonderful artist. I was very excited focusing on uh, lots of things that I'm interested in. Um, and one of the things he talks about is that uh, America is a crime scene for indigenous folks and that he's investigating. Um, and so from then I, 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 I saw some of his work randomly uh, and through, throughout the years, but when I did my Smithsonian Artist Research Fellowship, I had not realized that that is where um, his archive is. And so I was thrilled to go through his Polaroid images, um, some of the journals. And um, when Aperture approached me, I said, we have to have Kim Awan. Um, And so it's been really amazing because now Aperture has produced a, a, a book called A Kind of Prayer um, on Kim Awan's important work. And um, again, Kim Awan is messing with the photo image itself by um, like the photo itself and then maybe re-photographing, um, folding the photo, dipping it in tobacco. This is a uh, cold lake. It's a very important um, place for um, his community. And it's also, you know, wrapped up in talking about the land and those sort of nuances. And, and sort of building that personal archive of his that yes. is is so sort of it, related to the family and feels very intimate. It is very intimate. Um, and I, yeah, there's something really wonderful about going to an archive, but then go, going to an artist's work 
where they produce their own sort of archive <laughs> and that sort of contrast. Um, and his archive is very fun to go through. Yeah, and as part of the show, you pulled together uh, a slideshow of a number of the Polaroids, you know, that are very precious that really couldn't travel, but there's a slideshow and it's got a lovely uh, voiceover um, audio component to um, accompany it with Wendy reading his artist statement. Yes, and um, I hope you can put the artist statement up for the audience somewhere or link it because it's it's the best artist statement I've ever read. <laughs> um, it's we'll it's have to really... work on that. Yeah, and this is a, a Rebecca Belmore. Uh, she is, I, I believe, Anishinaabe. And um, she does a lot of performance work. Uh, she's based out of Canada. So it's interested in her storytelling, uh, sort of sort of like um, the way that that translates in her work. And then, you know, looking at Martine's work as well. So this is a series that's based off of a per performance um, that she did earlier on, and then she brought in her sister to sort of reenact parts of that uh, performance. Yeah, these <clears throat> these images are so compelling and strong in the gallery. They have such a presence to them. They do, and I, you know, actually through uh, looking at her work for the issue had not realized that this is her sister um, and that her sister uh, is shows up in a lot of her work. And um, I really liked learning that about about her and the work. Ah, this is um, Jacqueline Cleveland. Um, she's Alaska Native. Uh, and I actually went to undergrad at Montana State University in Bozeman. She was in the film department. I was in the art department. Um, and the way we met was at the Native Student Union, um, which I thought was kind cool. of funny because um, the art department and the film department are totally separate. So if we had not gone uh, to the Native Student Union, I don't think we would have ever met. And... <clears throat> I've stayed in touch with uh, Jacqueline. Uh, and one of the things I really liked um, when I was on Facebook, again, there's another like Facebook connection here, is that she took wonderful photos of um, her life there in Alaska and also of her community, also activities, foraging. And this work is about um, ethnobotany and preserving that. So I was really interested in including some of uh, her work because, um, you know, in some, some of the works we're talking about these origin stories that are um, oral and uh, we're creating our own imagery for them. And then with Jacqueline's work, it is, it is the land, it is focused on the land and what we gather from the land and what we try to preserve. So I'm really happy um, that she's included in this exhibition and in the magazine. Yeah, these are, these are really wonderful images. And, and, you know, it just rounds out the show so well, it just taps into all of these different um, connections to the land and to ancestral traditions in different ways. So varied, but, um, but yeah. focused in a way. And there, and there's a way that, um, Jacqueline photographs that it makes me feel like I'm actually there. Um, and I'm, and it doesn't make me feel like I'm a voyeur, but, I, uh, and it could only come from a person who is from that community that uh, really, knows um, the people. So that's one of the things I really love about the work is that I, I actually feel like I'm I'm there and um, getting to participate in, in what she's depicting. 
That's wonderful. And Guadalupe. And uh, Guadalupe Maravilla. Um, this is a, a really wonderful work of paintings um, that are collaborative in nature. Um, Mar uh, Guadalupe, Guadalupe is working with um, an artisan in Mexico um, and will send uh, like images from his phone to that artist to make paintings. And these also play on um, the origin story as well, his origin story as well. Retablo, yeah, these are retablos. So yeah, this is fun to uh, look at uh, sort of the, the photos and how that came about. And then just having that translate uh, back and forth between the two of them, but also the the paintings themselves traveling as well across the border. Yeah, and he sort of talks about um, like supporting these micro economies for these yes. different artisans. Yeah, and then yes. telling these stories about these border crossings and his sort of. Um, uh, kind of alter ego as the coyote yes yeah and again again like when i think about the the pandemic and i was following guadalupe on instagram and he was just doing these amazing things in new york city where he was getting food and money and then giving that to um uh, immigrants and uh, it was just really amazing to kind of see that. So that it fits in very well with this this work as, as well. Mm -hmm. Great. And do we have, is that we're at the end? I thought we had one more artist, but um, wonderful. Thank you so much. So many of the works selected and this is, you know, we're opening the dialogue. Everybody join in. Um, selected for this exhibition, engage with the indigenous archives, both contemporary and historic representations to sort of excavate these repressed histories of colonialization and the ongoing impacts um, eviction from native lands and cultural erasure. Um, so it brings to mind this, this idea of trusting memory over history. And I wonder if any of you could speak to your approach to expanding like a collective memory through sort of this visual sovereignty of sort of, you know, your self-representation. I could speak to that to some extent. There, there is a real question of agency within, um, I guess, much, much of my practice is questioning agency and and really wanting to, um, you know, question official narratives around uh, indigenous relationships. And um, and then to take those things and turn them around <laughs> so that we get a strong sense of agency on our own part. So even though we're being photographed, then to take those photographs years later and use them for our own purposes. And one of the things that I felt was um, really inspiring about uh, the generations before me was that even though there, even though our ceremonies were outlawed, by Canadian law and our people were going to jail for practicing, uh, they still found ways to appropriate colonial mechanisms in order to perpetuate uh, our traditions. And so I, I kind of see that in relationship to uh, even exhibition, like an exhibition like this, uh, then takes these institutions and through these institutions, kind of um, does the same thing. 
uh, in, in the past, these institutions and even the medium have been oppressive to Indigenous people, but in a contemporary context now, Indigenous people like uh, Wendy, in terms of putting exhibitions together, um, are and allowing certain voices to come through, are then allowing that agency to, to emerge institutionally. That's great. That's great. And you're really, you're really recasting these image. I mean, you're physically projecting them onto the walls, surfaces, facades of these spaces, right? Yeah, so it's a real physical manifestation as well as conceptual. So you, yes, so you're Wendy. Uh, I'll I'll say something. <laughs> Um, I think, uh, for me, I've been working around memory since the beginning of my, of my art practice. And I'm always thinking about, um, this, um, way of how memory have this, has these two aspects, one that is very uh, data fact oriented and the other one that is feeling and sensing. And that side of memory doesn't really get um, seen as much because we're so, um, as a society, we're fixated on, on like what we can prove. And these memories that are in our bodies or the things that are passed down to us by our ancestors are sometimes not written, at least in my case. And in many cases, so I, you know, the, the, the first body of work that I created, which is called Other Stories, was was that um, um, kind of um, almost like protesting this idea of like, OK, so these are the memories that I get to remember because they were photographed. So I was kind of also protesting photography and in and, and, and its role of capturing something that later became my memory, but I really do not recall that as my own, but it was imposed to me. So I recreated an album with my family and um, and then making this body of work with Meta, it was also a similar way of like, okay, how do you remember or 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 re remember, right? So yeah, so that's just wanted to share. That's great, thank you. Yeah, it is so much of a kind of way of remembering that becomes embodied in our in our way of being right um which brings me to a quote of yours marianne that i read about in the magazine uh in the aperture magazine that i thought just really beautifully expressed your practice um that your your process is to mine the collections to make a living memory once you embody it, you don't need the photograph, which I thought was so just kind of, you know, it, it just really like expands our way of thinking about it. And I wondered if you could expand on that concept of a living memory. Yeah, one of the, one of the things that really struck me was that through our own ceremonial traditions, you know, rather than having a literary uh, tradition, writing things down, we perform them. And then through our lifetimes, we, uh, through witnessing and participation, we create a, a communal memory of who we are. And, um, and I thought, oh my God, how powerful that is, you know, like, and what I was really noticing was that today in mining the archival um, records and you know there, there was a there's this like process of anthropology or the colonial gaze documenting and um, and then we go in and we you know we're we're remining that but we're reminding ourselves you know like our our original way of remembering was in in the body 
so that our body would remember our body contains those memories um and but i do love this aspect of taking going to the archive and taking back what was removed as a record and then for us they're like mnemonic devices for us to continue to me remember and i just think it's so amazing because of course a lot of this work was being done at a time when people were thinking oh you know they're going to go away they're going to disappear they're going to assimilate and instead we're taking all this stuff back so they they wanted this record of us and i'm like oh now look at us now we're going in and we're mining those places and we're taking this material back and we're remembering even strongly even more strongly than before who we are and where we come from and what our rights are so Yeah, and that kind of brings me to it, something that Wendy and I discussed where we were talking about the archives, and, or maybe I read this in the magazine. Uh, you're, you're talking about the archives and not only going in and, and learning and making discoveries of your own ancestors, but also helping to identify and provide information for the collections themselves in terms of what things or people or different identities and and what things mean similar to the photographs that you showed earlier where you're you're making all those notations and kind of explaining um what these things mean and and how these this sort of images can be read or the li liter you know the legibility of them and i just wondered if you could talk more about that kind of experience of going into the archive and being able to also give them knowledge as well. Yeah, um, I really like this idea of uh, the living memory that Marianne is talking about, because I think, you know, when I go into an archive, I often end up calling my dad um, and, um, and that's sort of where things connect where uh, he just, he, he's just living. He is, he is just being crow. <laughs> it's sort of hard to explain. Um, and so there are these encounters or memories that I have of growing up on the reservation that when I go into these collections um, and see an object or a photo, I'm, I can connect it to an experience that I, I grew up doing um, and that's something that's really powerful and awesome um, to see, to, to be able to do that. And, um, you know, for me, like, for instance, with the 1880 Crow Peace delegation and going over all the chief's outfits, Crow men, when we, uh, uh, when they parade, they wear those outfits. Our, um, the elk tooth dress that I often uh, use in my work, it's a traditional Crow woman's dress. Um, we all wear those and it's, it's normal to us. Um, it's who we are, but then when you start to sort of look into, um, the different parts, like that, um, the honor shirt, um, encompasses how a chief becomes a chief, um, and sharing that back, um, I think is so important because, if you're like just a somebody who has no connection to the Crow community and you're looking at an object, you might think that it is very aesthetically pleasing, but that's such a like a little read of how powerful and important um, every object is for Crow people. Um, and, you know, I've also encountered other Crows that have gone before me, like, uh, uh, in the 60s, um, Joe Medicine Crow had gone and he had written all these things. And so it was really cool to like read what Joe Medicine Crow, he's a descendant of Medicine Crow, what he wrote on some of the, the, the photos. And then I myself got to add into like a photo of my, um, my grandfather and a, well, he was born in 1907. I'm like in a historical photo, 
<laughs> but he uh he's seen a lot my grandpa has seen a lot he used to ride in the wagon of um chief Plenku, which is our last chief he died in the 30s uh, so he knew him very well and he knew um, a lot of the chiefs that had traveled to washington dc but in that i got to ride on the back you know i showed the picture to my dad and he's like oh yeah that's your grandpa he <laughs> was like wait a minute like this is like amazing um so yeah i was able to you know write on the back of that photograph that you know i was here this date and this is uh, uh wallace red star senior old man eagle um so i don't know where i'm going with my rambling <laughs> But I just think it's really important to, um, these aren't just objects. Um, There's so much more. Um, And I I think if an institution has these objects and we can't have them back, they must understand how important they are and how much they mean to those communities. And um, if, if we don't let them know, then you know, they're just objects in storage on a shelf. Well, and I think that's one of the really important things about this exhibition that you've pulled together and the artists represented is that I think it's brought such an awareness to some of these stories. Um, you know, I know I've had experiences with people sort of telling me like, oh, I didn't know about this. I grew up in New York and I had no idea about this history. And so it really is um a retelling of of history and a, new, a like giving us a broader perspective into this land's history and i think it's just really powerful and important and i really appreciate all of you for giving us this opportunity to explore this in such a deep and profound way so um we do have a couple questions. Um, we've got one from Linda Myers that says, Wendy, I it says I own a Kevin Red Star. Are you related? Um, yeah, that's my uncle. Uh, he's my dad's brother. Um, and my dad says, because oftentimes people will say, is, is that your dad, Kevin? <laughs> and my, my dad's name is Wallace. And he's like, just tell them, you know, um, Kevin's the artist, but Wallace is the really good looking one. So, <laughs> um, yeah, he's my, he's my uncle. Okay. And then I've got another question here um, from Marty. Hey, Marty. Uh, poet Natalie Diaz often talks about the constructed colonial image of indigenous peoples. In your practices, how do you grasp, disrupt this image? Can you repeat that again? <laughs> sure. Uh, this poet, Natalie Diaz, often talks about the constructed colonial image of indigenous peoples. And she's asking, in your practices, how do you grasp or disrupt this image? You know, you know what I think is fascinating because, uh, you know, Edward Curtis always comes up in this conversation and constructed sure. photos of Native people. But I, th I think through like doing my research, um, I realized that actually, you know what, those photos, they only happened because Edward Curtis had to get somebody for, from within that community to uh, give them access. So for instance, for my tribe, it was um, Alexander Upshaw, who was like one of the first kids that went to uh, boarding school. He, he was that first generation. And so when I see Edward Curtis photos of um, my tribe, I'm actually seeing Alexander Upshaw 
because there's some really amazing um, writing that Curtis was able to get. And it, it's all because of Alexander Upshaw. So I think, you know, behind a lot of these photos uh, taken by uh, white folks at the time, um, there was a native person from that community. Um, and so I think that's the thing that I, I think disrupts it for me, as I know it's, you know, Alexander Upshaw. Marianne, Froyo, anything to add? Yeah, I, th I think um, to support what Wendy's saying, you know, like uh, among, amongst our people, George Hunt was helping Edward Curtis. And uh, in, in a way, I, I don't think that our people who were participating and being photographed were completely um, um, kind of unengaged in, it, it wasn't necessarily a one-way relationship. I think our people were certainly aware that they could utilize these things to their own purposes in that time. And, and maybe there was even a thought amongst our people that if we couldn't reproduce our knowing ways of knowing ceremonially because they were being um, oppressed, that there were other mechanisms. So, so I think there was a form of agency coming from behind the scenes. Um, yeah. So I, I agree with what 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 Wendy's saying. Also, you know, one of the oh, sorry. Oh, go for it. Go for it. Well, I was just thinking about agency. Um, and for my community, we had been photographed a lot by the time Curtis came. He came in, uh, like, I can't, like 1907, 1908 or something like that. And so, you know, we know what was, we knew what the deal was. And a lot of times we wanted money. So, so a lot of, uh, a lot of the sitters were like, give me some money, you know, <laughs> and, and well, get our portrait taken, but we were very well aware of uh, the photographic medium. And and um, so I always find that kind of fascinating because I think Cur Edward Curtis, they make it seem like he was sort of the first photographer to photograph all those people, but there's been like a long history, especially with my community of um, white photographers coming in and photographing. Mm -hmm. And I think there's a couple of good, uh essays about that in the Native American magazine about some of the the ones that were welcomed in and sort of portrayed the communities and in and in, in a sort of like the way they wanted to be portrayed as um what was it Horace I'm blanking on his last name anyway Koyo you had something <laughs> to add that's my train of thought <laughs> but it's something similar <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, we've got another comment. Just sincere thanks for sharing your experiences so generously. Appreciate the holistic view of life that you each bring your work as part of a cosmos, a full landscape, the universe embodied. There's another question about um, if there's a discussion about the repatriation of sacred objects to tribes from museums like the Smithsonian in the same way that there's been a movement to repatriate objects from the British Museum, for instance, to lands where the works were taken. Yeah, definitely. When I was at doing my um, research fellowship, um, there's some medicine bundles that are for my fourth great grandfather, his name's Greenskin. And um, they said, you know, these are eligible for you to bring back, you'd have to prove uh, your descendancy. Um, and it's the oldest member who would do it. Um, so, you know, my dad could could fill out the paperwork and get it started. But you know what? I saw like a, a saddle of my grandma's and things that, um, you know, medicine bundles are specifically an individual's um, possession. So, um, you know, seeing these saddles, a saddle that my uh, um, great grandma had, I, to me, it's like, let's get those back. 
we need those. We, you know, we use those, we see those. It would be nice to get the utilitarian things back as well. I mean, they're so important to um, who we are and also um, they were taken away and um, we can learn so much from them. So yeah, I always think about like, yes, it's great to get the sacred items back and human remains, but all everything is important to come back to the community. Yeah, I know there is a big repatriation discussion going on at the Smithsonian about human remains right now, and not specifically indigenous human remains, but I think all their collection um, and they are, looking into that very deeply and seriously. Um, well, I want to be respectful of everyone's time and offer each of you any last words to share before we say our farewell. It's been such a pleasure and I'm, I've got a few um, upcoming announcements to make, but I just want to give you a few moments to add anything that you feel like you didn't get to share before we wrap up. I just want to say my thanks and appreciation to Cuello and Marianne um, for going on this epic traveling adventure um, from magazine to um, to exhibitions. And I also just want to shout out Aperture. Um, they are really wonderful to the people that they work with. And I know that a lot of people in the magazine have done other programming things with them. Um, and yeah, I, I just thought it was great that not only was it a magazine, but, you know, now it's an exhibition and, um, you know, and opportunities as well. So, um, yeah, just, uh, thank you. I also just wanted to say thank you very much, Wendy, for having me in the magazine and for uh, you know for this beautiful experience and to be able to read the magazine and like just you know take it all in it's really fantastic fantastic thank you and thank you as well Sarah for inviting me you're welcome and, and I just wanted to say thank you as well it's it's been a really great experience to kind of consider these things think about these ideas and and then to see it translated from the magazine into an exhibition. And uh, yeah, thank you, Wendy, for all the hard work around that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all. And I echo the, the special thanks to Annette Booth at uh, Aperture. She's been really wonderful to work with. And we've just had such an amazing um, support from the entire Aperture team for that. So and thank you all. And I just want to wrap up by uh, announcing a few upcoming events. And if you're local to the region, please join us for these, um, including an artist lecture with Guadalupe Maravilla on October 19th as part of the um, USF School of Art and Art History Kennedy Family Visiting Artist Lecture Series. On November 4th, uh, USF CAM is presenting What Remains, Listening to Indigenous Perspectives Forum, which gathers the voices of uh, Florida-based Indigenous artists, Native American civil rights and environmental advocates in dialogue with an expert in the field of anthropology to explore ways of it of restoring and expanding indig Indigenous cultural agency by honoring tribal heritage and ecological knowledge. And on November 30th, USF CAM will hold two student-led tours of the exhibition and more info about all our events can be found on USF CAM's event page on the website. And we hope to see you there. And thank you, Wendy, Marianne, Koyo, for sharing all your insight and knowledge with us. And I hope everyone has a wonderful rest of their day. Thank mm -hmm. you.